So good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and you're very welcome to the launch of the 2022 Eurobarometer report for Ireland. I'm Tim Hayes, and I am head of communication at the European Commission representation in Ireland. I'm very pleased to moderate the event during which we'll hear the key findings from this year's Eurobarometer national report. Eurobarometer is the polling instrument used by the European Commission and indeed all of the other EU institutions to monitor the state of public opinion in Europe on key trends relevant to the European Union. So each year, Eurobarometer conducts a standard survey which covers a wide range of issues and it measures citizens' attitudes towards the EU, its policies and its actions. This latest survey was completed across the EU in late January and early February of this year and gives us an insight into public opinion during this snapshot in time. So it's important really to bear this time frame in mind because even though it was less than two months since the fieldwork was completed, much has changed across Europe since then. In January, the world and Ireland began to reopen after a, a very difficult and challenging two years during the COVID-19 pandemic. And we were all eager to return to normality. Now at the moment, we're seeing a significant upsur upsurge in, in COVID cases as a new and highly transmissible variant brings us fresh concerns. Then on the 24th of February, we watched in horror as Russia invaded Ukraine and started a war on the EU's eastern border. The devastating impact on the Ukrainian people and the ripple effect across Europe and throughout the world has been felt deeply on both a humanitarian and an economic level. So our focus has naturally shifted, but the views of the Irish citizens on the issues that affected them in their daily lives remain as relevant as ever. To tell us more about how the Irish people view the European Union, their level of trust in the key institutions, and their attitude towards the economy and the media. I'm really delighted to welcome our guest speaker for this morning, Mr. Luke Rapier. He's Managing Director of Behaviour and Attitudes, and he wrote this national report. Luke has over 25 years experience in the Irish market. Before he joined BNA, he was a board director of TNS MRBI in Ireland, and he also previously worked for Lands on Market Research. Luke is a psychology graduate of University College Dublin with a BA in psychology and a master's in social and organization psychology. He is currently chair of the Association of Irish Market Research Organizations. We're really delighted that Luke is joining us today to present the findings of this report. So I look forward to hearing more about the results of the survey from an Irish perspective. After his presentation, Luke is more than happy to take your questions. So please make sure to send them to us either by email to events at European in movement.ie that's events at european movement.ie which will appear on your screen just now or on your screen via the european movement live event center if you're active on social media today's hashtag is hashtag eurobarometer so without further ado i now give the floor to luke luke over to you please thank you tim uh, I'm delighted to present, obviously, the annual uh, Eurobarometer report for Ireland uh, today. Um, we'll just, I'll, what I'll do is I'll run through a, a brief um, presentation, um, <clears throat> after which um, we'll take some uh, questions um, and that. So we'll, we'll pull up the uh, presentation now on screen. The, um, the report uh, essentially is some key highlights uh, of the study. So there's a comprehensive report and obviously Tabia report that, that is available for everyone to peruse. Um, and if we move on, I'll just talk a little bit about the, um, the background to the, the study. Uh, as Tim mentioned, um, the fieldwork was conducted 18th of uh, January to the 14th of February. So that's important to remember is that snapshot in time. Uh, Behaviour and Attitudes, b &A, uh, conduct the fieldwork on behalf of Kantar. And we utilize a face-to-face -face, uh, CAPI computer-rated personal interviewing methodology with a random stage one probability, random probability sampling approach and that. Um, a total of just over a thousand adults age 15 plus are interviewed for each wave of uh, Eurobarometer uh, in, in Ireland and, and indeed other, other countries uh, as well. In that. So a very robust sample, as, as you well know. The, the fewer work timings was always interesting to know what was going on at that particular point in time. It sort of reflects, I suppose, um, 
uh, attitudes during a period when we are still under, I suppose, many restrictions. Um, uh, you know, it, it's, it's, it's only a few months ago, but literally you, you know, things move so fast nowadays that, that you have to cast your mind back to actually what went on at that particular point in time. So hospitality was still closing at 8 p.m. Mask wearing was mandatory in public places. There were limited numbers of at um, weddings and funerals. And, and, and as Tim mentioned, is prior to the Russian uh, invasion of the Ukraine. Lab. So with the, there's five sort of themes which I'll cover today. The first is trust in European institutions and EU direction for the future. We'll talk a little bit about the Irish economy and, and lifestyle and keeping up to date on that and, and projection for the next 12 months. We'll look at democracy under the microscope. Um, and we'll look at trust in the media and different uh, channels. And then uh, finish off with uh, satisfaction with uh, coronavirus measures both here and in across the EU. So if we move on and we take the first section, which is trust in European institutions and EU direction for the future. And if we move on to the next slide, what we see here is, uh, first of all, taking uh, at the temperature of, I suppose, the perception of the EU. So what does the EU conjure up? Is it a positive? Is it a, uh, a, a negative image or is it a neutral image? And what we have on the chart here is tracked over time in the blue, uh, essentially the, the, the proportion of the population, the Irish population that have a positive image of, of, of the EU. So 71% of the population of a positive image of the EU. Um, only 6% of the uh, population would have a, a negative image and about 23% would, uh, would be neutral. Uh, and that compares very positively to the average for the EU 27, which where the positivity rate is at 44%. And if you track that over time uh, and the various events over the course of history, say back to 2020, uh, 20, we can see that you know, we follow a certain we follow a certain form in Ireland in having having a, a, a batting above the average in terms of having a very positive um, a view of of the uh, of the EU. Uh, it was only around um, the EU IMF program uh, and entering that um, and that particular uh, the 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 basically the economic or global economic crisis whereby we we dipped in terms of our positive disposition towards the eu and then we've been on recovery mode uh, ever since of that and when the pandemic hit as you saw uh, again we saw an, an uplift in our positivity towards uh, the eu which is which is uh, fantastic so um it's ireland's significantly more positive it follows uh, our, our our form in this regard uh, towards the eu if we move on then to the next slide and what we see then is we we, we wanted to look at to what extent um uh or, or the level of trust that uh, that irish citizens um had in the various uh, eu institutions and and what we can see here uh is and sorry some of the, the went to decimal place for some reason here but it's 64 percent basically um of irish citizens have trust essentially in the european parliament 63 percent have trust in the european commission and, and so forth in that. So almost two thirds of Irish citizens trust the European Parliament, the European Commission, uh, the European Central Bank and the European Council. And that's significantly higher than the EU uh, 27 average. So for the European Parliament, it's only half of the, uh, those across EU 27 would have uh, trust on average with the European Parliament compared to about two thirds of the Irish population. If we move on to the next slide, um, and then we want, what we wanted to see then was um, at this present time, do people th feel that things are going in the right or wrong direction in our country and also in, in, in uh, the European Union? And what we see is the majority of Irish citizens believe that things are going in the right direction, both in Ireland and indeed in the EU as well. And when we compare that with the, uh, the average for the EU 27, um, you know, only 36% the EU 27 on average, I uh, believe uh, their country is going in the right direction and a similar proportion believing that the European Union is going in, in, the, uh, in, the, in, the, in the right direction in that. So we see that Ireland, again, is considerably more positive about the EU future direction than their EU counterparts. If we move on then, and we looked at then uh, opt optimism is the other um, uh, element and we, we compared it across various countries here. Um, so to, to what extent they are, uh, people are optimistic uh, about the future of the EU. Um, and we see, as with the EU average, around uh, 62% uh, on average in terms of optimism, which is, which is good and very positive. Um, but we see Ireland, I suppose, leading uh, the pack of countries at 88% of our population 
uh, being um, um, uh, optimistic in terms of the, uh, the the future of Europe and a, a, a marked gap down to I suppose Portugal, Denmark, etc. and that, and a far um, higher than I suppose when we look at uh, Greeks, uh, Greece, uh, which follows uh, towards the, towards the end uh, down there. If we move on to the next slide. We then will move on to the next section, which deals with the Irish economy and uh, in terms of lifestyle and that. So in terms of attitudes to the key drivers of the Irish economy, um, so the majority and what we look at here is the situation of the Irish economy, uh, the employment situation in Ireland, but also personal job situation and the financial situation of the household. Yeah? So the majority of Irish citizens believe the economy is in a, is in a good, split, good place. Yeah? Notwithstanding that, we, we still have about a third would have reservations about the economy at a national level uh, when, when the poll was taken. And, and a quarter uh, are concerned uh, about um, the, um, the, um, the current, employment situ current employment situation of that. Um, you know, the, the, but when we look at, I suppose, the personal situation of people, it's more easily more positive and, and, and that. And again, you think about the background uh, to this, you know, uh, we're coming out of the, um, the, um, the, the pandemic. Um, a lot of household debt was was uh, um, paid off uh, over the intervening years since the uh, uh, the uh, bailout uh, and the and the crisis, and that's so Irish households were in a much better position now than actually when we hit the international crisis previously. And that the other interesting thing is that there's stark differences between how Irish citizens view the national economy and employment situation versus the, the EU uh, the EU 27 average of that. So the situation in the Irish economy, 63% would be positive. It's only 39% on average uh, for the situation in, in other countries uh, and, and, and that. And again, when you look at the employment situation, again, 75% are positive in, uh, about the employment situation in Ireland versus 43% in terms of EU average of that. So quite, quite different. If we move on then to expectations for the Irish economy over the next 12 months, bearing in mind the timescale, of, of the of the um, of the of the study of that, on balance uh, again the same same metrics, but uh, again for just for the next twelve months we assess these. On balance, more Irish citizens were looking forward with great uh, with great positivity about the uh, about the future economy and that. Uh, once again, I suppose we're considering more positive than many of our uh, EU counterparts, uh, which is which is uh, good and that. And I suppose there was another question within the study um, which looked at. I suppose concerns, you know, and it is say say even at the, the stage of the um, the, the research uh, in terms of the field work in in January and early February, and that we still had uh, over four in ten um, um, of Irish citizens concerned about prices and inflation and the cost of living at that particular stage, and that and that was only about a quarter of people mentioning that. Uh, in terms of the corresponding survey back in 2021. So we can see uh, that, you know, that inflation and other concerns were obviously still registering at this point at the time of our, um, of our field work. We move on to the next slide then. Uh, we'll talk now about this section about democracy under the Microsoft. So the um, first uh, element here is to, to look at to what extent people were satisfied uh, with the way democracy works I suppose in our own country, but also in the way it works in the EU. And we see that Irish citizens are you know, satisfied with how democracy works, both in Ireland and also uh, the EU. And when we look at the uh, comparison versus our EU counterparts and that on average, you know, where was 83% are satisfied with how democracy works in Ireland, that's 56% on average uh, across the EU 27 and that, and uh, a similar proportions where, you know, in terms of their people's perceptions with uh, or, or, or opinion on satisfaction with the way democracy works in across uh, the EU uh, as well. We move on then um, to trust in the media. And here what we did, we assessed a number of different um, uh, types of media uh, and to see to what extent uh, the people had trust in, in the various uh, formats and that. So we see what came true in Ireland was that trust in radio is very strong, followed by uh, TV, um, and um, trust in the internet and, uh, social, and online social networks is much lower. Yeah, so the Irish citizens are, are, are much less uh, trusting uh, of, of those and that. And uh, what we see is that Irish citizens are more trusting of radio yeah, and in terms of TV than their EU uh, 27 counterparts, but uh, more EU 20 seven citizens yeah would trust the internet yeah 
So it will be 35% uh, across the EU, 27 on average, versus 26% in, in Ireland. And I suppose uh, everyone uh, a little bit less, less trusting of online uh, social, social networks. We move on then uh, to the uh, final section, which is, deals with satisfaction with coronavirus measures. So uh, reaction to, I suppose, the measures that were taken. Um, so we looked at measures, satisfaction with measures taken by the government to fight, fight the pandemic, uh, the regional and local authorities, and then measures taken by the European Union to fight the pandemic. And so what we see in terms of the Irish figures here is that um, Irish, the Irish population are, are highly satisfied uh, and indeed considerably more satisfied with the measures uh, taken by various authorities, both Irish and, and European, to fight the pandemic compared to the uh, European counterparts in that. So satisfaction with our own government, 78% will be satisfied to three, three, three and four, three quarters of us, whereas it'll be half, about half on average. Um, are satisfied with their own government across the EU average uh, and that. And when you take it, the, the European perspective, it's a similar proportion, to be honest, to you know, three and four and half uh, in, uh, in the EU 27 would be uh, satisfied with the, with the reaction, uh, with the measures taken by the European Union. So the Irish population, um, very satisfied um, with, uh, the, well, not very satisfied with the pandemic, but let's just say um, uh, the measures taken to uh, tackle it. Um, and then just to have a look at where we uh, rank just overall in that. So we have our EU average, you know, in terms of uh, satisfaction with the uh, measures taken to, to uh, ta tackle the coronavirus pandemic in that, uh, which is around uh, half, uh, half there, um, 40, 49%. And we see Ireland um, in, in a bunch of countries that would be uh, up near the top, you know, we're second uh, only to, to Portugal. Uh, in terms of satisfaction uh, with measures uh, taken by the European Union to fight the pandemic and that, uh, with France would follow um, more down the, the bottom end of the scale on that. And actually our satisfaction level has actually increased um, over since last year as well, which is which is great. The um, Then I suppose the final aspect is um, looking at um, level of trust in the EU to make the right decisions in terms of uh, the future um, uh, with reference to, I suppose, our, our response to the coronavirus pandemic and that. So the majority of our citizens, yeah, the Irish citizens, 83%, trust the EU to make good choices in the future of that, um, which is fantastic, you know, and, and that uh, it compares with the uh, EU average of 60%. So um, we're, uh, again, extremely high in terms of our trust levels there. And then when we focused in on the um, next generation EU recovery plan, and we have a little description there of that. Um, you know, as many as 85% of the Irish population um, would view it uh, to be effective compared to about just over half of other uh, Europeans uh, on average uh, overall. So just to sum up then, just a couple of slides before we open up the, the two questions. So first of all, in terms of trust in European institutions and the EU direction for the future of that. So as we saw that Irish citizens, we hold a very a positive view of uh, the EU in general. We have a majority of 71% have a positive image uh, of the EU in general. Uh, and that it's, it, it rises uh, with age, so it gets a little bit stronger as people get older in that. And you've about two thirds of Irish citizens trusting, I suppose, the European Parliament and the European Commission. And you've about 60% trusting the European Central Bank and the European Council. And, and, and those figures are uh, uh, substantially higher than the EU at 27. Than that. Irish citizens are also optimistic about the future of, of the EU, about, in this respect, about one in 10 feel in any way pessimistic. Um, and, and the attitudes are very consistent across uh, demograph population demographics. And then in terms of things going in the right direction, we have a majority of 71% uh, as well, feel that we're going in the right direction um, uh, and, that, and that's up substantially on um, the, the uh, standard euro barometer at 95 in 2021, whereas that's 64% of that. That's 62% hold a similar uh, view about the direction of the European Union. Uh, and again, that's uh, in stark contrast to the average for the uh, EU 27 countries where only 36 and 37% believe their country or the European country Union is going in the right direction on that. We move on then uh, around the economy and lifestyle. So broadly speaking, the majority of Irish citizens at that point in time believe the Irish economy is in a good situation in that. Uh, there's still about a third that had reservations uh, at a personal level, uh, about eight and 10 felt they were in a, a good, the household was in a good uh, financial position in that. Uh, only one, well, one in 10 were dissatisfied with their personal job in that. And um, Ireland was significantly more positive compared to the European average, especially around the economy and the job situation. In that. 
Um, and again, I suppose it should be borne in mind that these results reflect the views of the Irish population in the early stages of the inflation cycle uh, that we're experiencing here at the moment of that. But even then, at, the, at, at that stage, you know, about 44% were citing rising prices, inflation, cost of living as a top two issue facing Ireland. And that was only about a quarter were citing that um, uh, last year. On that. Um, so democracy under Microsoft, so about just over eight, eight, eight and four and five basically, uh, respectively, are, are, are satisfied with how democracy works in Ireland and the EU. Uh, and that compares very fav favorably uh, compared to just over half or, or with, a, with a score, uh, with those with, with scores for the EU uh, average on that. Um, in general, slightly fewer younger adults are satisfied with how democracy works in Ireland when compared to older adults uh, by, by a margin. We move on to the next slide. Um, so the final one, just in terms of trust in uh, media, we saw that radio content, very strong trust across the board, most trusted type media, followed by TV and that. Trust in written press stands around uh, half the population trust that, while trust in uh, the internet and social online social networks is considerably lower uh, and that. Other EU citizens are a little bit less trusting most of the media while being a little bit more trusting of the internet. In terms of satisfaction with um, coronavirus measures and that, again, um, you know, very positive um, satisfaction with uh, measures, uh, with, uh, with the Irish government and local authority measures to fight the pandemic. Um, and we've actually significantly improved on those um, from 2021 in terms of that uh, particular evaluation. Um, uh, and also we see that um, three and four or, uh, our citizens are also satisfied with measures taken by the European Union um, uh, as well. That uh, that compares with only half, uh, well, about 49% when it comes to European average uh, as well. And the majority of Irish citizens also trust the EU to make the right decisions in the future. Uh, that's 83% uh, this time around. And that's an increase from 79% last year uh, as well on that, compared to, I suppose, the EU average being 60% uh, having trust in the EU to make the right decisions, which actually did decrease from 65% last year. Uh, and as many as yeah, 85% uh, of Irish people believe the next generation EU package will be effective um, in, um, in, in responding to the effects of the coronavirus pandemic, compared to only about uh, just over half uh, across the EU average, uh, and that, believing that to be the case. So look, overall, a very strong set of results uh, for, for Ireland. Uh, compared to uh, the EU27 uh, on a variety of different metrics. Thank you. Yeah, many thanks, Luke, for the um, the excellent presentation and the really superb analysis. I think that there's a lot to take away from this report, but I find it very, very encouraging uh, that Irish citizens still remain very positive about the EU, or at least that was the situation uh, in January and February when the snapshot was, was taken. So now we move to the, the question and answer session, and we have received a number of, of questions uh, for Luke. Uh, could you please continue to submit your questions to events at europeanmovement.ie? And the first question I'd like to put to you, you, Luke, is whether or not, as an experienced pollster, did you find any of the results surprising or even markedly different to the previous Eurobarometer surveys for Ireland? Yeah, I, I suppose there's a, there's, yeah, there's a couple of things that, that struck me. Um, you know, first of all, it's very encouraging that uh, the, the positivity rate uh, towards the EU um, on behalf of Irish citizens, and, and we're still following that form, and the pandemic hasn't dented it, which is which is great. The the area of trust in radio, I thought was was interesting, just in terms of media. Um, you know, with radio coming out it's very very strong, and it sort, it sort of makes sense when you think about it. When we had more working from home during the pandemic, we saw radio audiences grow substantially. Um, so it's probably due to a changing sort of behavior and dynamics that are that are happening. That and that I think that's important in terms of our communication and in terms of communication channels. Uh, as well in that. The, the other interesting thing I saw was um, that we had about a 75 up to 81% increase in satisfaction with the way democracy works in the EU. Um, so it's great to witness that positivity. It would be interesting to see does this increase um, or decrease as a result of uh, Russia's invasion of the Ukraine. So just to see how that, that sort of pans out as, uh, as well in that. And there's one other aspect that sort of struck me as well. Um, we had a question in there, Q... Um, C4, which which asks, in your opinion, among the among the following subjects, which are those that most create a feeling of community among European citizens, and 
typical elements of country state will always be around values, rule of law, mm. culture. But Ireland actually over ends excellent in sport and significantly up in, in, in the last wave and also education as well. And there were two sort of hot topics over the pandemic and that. So it's interesting those little nuggets and nuances that you can look at uh, via from, from different countries and that. Yeah, thanks. Look, I mean, I sometimes hear from my colleagues in Brussels when they look at the statistics for Ireland, they're quite surprised at the number of people in Ireland who listen to the radio on a continuous basis and, and use it as a source of information. Uh, and I think, you know, it's a good reflection on the quality of broadcasting that we, we have in Ireland. But let's move on to the next question that we have. Uh, what do you think explains Ireland's continued high level of positivity towards the EU? And do you think that Brexit has reinforced Irish people's positive views towards the EU? Yeah, well, look, Ireland has form in being very positive towards the EU. That's the, the first thing. You know, we trended that over, over time. Um, but we know we're a tiny nation. We need to make friends to su survive and, and thrive. And I think Brexit, look, it's, it's undoubtedly reinforced the importance of the EU for Ireland, especially with Britain now out um, and that. And we can see, I suppose Irish people also see the, the close neighbour in terms of the, the damage potentially that, that Brexit is doing to Britain. And they worry about Northern Ireland as well. So in terms of that sort of mix and that, that um, you know, uh, that, you know, the Brexit has, has I suppose, probably copper fastened our, our positive disposition to the EU and, and, our, and indeed our, our self-preservation, our need to be in the EU and be a committed sort of member uh, and, and, and that, you know. And we've, like Irish people, when you do qualitative work with them, they'll always acknowledge we have benefited from the EU substantially and the classic is roads <laughs> that, always, that always comes up, you know, and obviously so much, so much more we benefit from. But, you know, they, they will always raise that and, and know that, that it has been to our advantage being being a member of the EU. I'm very positive of that. And we're very um, we're very outward looking uh, as well. You know, we're a very liberal uh, mind minded country and that no real hard left or hard right. Um, and we're very all embracing as, 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 as a nation and that. So um, yeah, I, I, I certainly think Brexit is, is copper facing some of the views though. Okay, super, thanks. And now we move to question from Ian Talbot of uh, Chambers Ireland uh, and Ian says that looking at the state of the economy and the expectations in the next 12 months including the uh, uh, central banks report that came out this morning it seems that people are consistently rating their own situation as being much better than their perception of the overall economy so there's a sort of a sense of you know things are worse for others than they are for me and Ian wonders whether or not this is a communications or a media issue, and is there a way do you think uh, of solving this perception issue? Perception issue? Yeah, I'd say yeah. No, it's good. It's a good question. And look, we see it, and it's 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 it always comes up, you know. Um, uh, but but it shows that people do answer very honestly in terms of their, in terms of their views and that, and it is their own personal situation that that you look at. Um, they they don't know all the dynamics. The politics, the metrics—they don't grasp fully grasp all of those. So what they see, and I and I think when you see in the media, and you see, oh, inflation spikes to seven percent, or you see uh, growth is cut and slashed in half, you know it does it does put the jitters of people, and and you see we see, we see our consumer confidence metrics um, drop back at that. But people are looking at themselves and saying, well, actually I'm I'm okay, which is reflected, I suppose, number one, in the tax receipts in Ireland, because they've never been as high, we've never been had as many people employed in the country ever in the history of the state, I think. Um, and we've been paying down debt, the household debt is also been falling uh, as well in that. So it is a, it is a perceptual um, um, thing um, that, 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 is, that is out there. Um, and it's, it's, it's something that uh, I suppose lawmakers and everybody has to battle with, you know, in terms of keeping the positive spirits up, uh, but not letting people get ahead of themselves because it's too inflationary and that as well. So it's always that balancing act, but it is a metric that always we look at, well, actually, how do people feel themselves? Well, actually, I'm okay, like, you know, because I can actually know myself, but, you know, the people want the confidence that the country is, 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 is doing well uh, as well to spend money. 
Okay, thanks very much, Luke. And our next question comes from uh, Dr. Catherine Simpson of Manchester Metropolitan University. Uh, and if I remember correctly, Dr. Simpson was one of the people that analysed the European Movements Report uh, last year, which was published in, in May of, of last year. So she has skin in the game, as they say. Uh, and she has a technical question. She would like to know whether or not the uh, bar Eurobarometer Report has questions on support for EU membership and the benefits of EU membership. And I believe the reason she's asking these questions is these are the sort of questions that are asked in the uh, European movement Red Sea, uh, but perhaps you can address the actual questions that were asked in this context in the Eurobarometer report, please, Luke. Um, I, I will have to probably get back to you on just on that particular question. I don't know if it's covered in this particular wave. They are covered in, in certain ways, but I just need to probably confirm that and I can go back on that if that's okay. Yeah, that's okay then. I mean, I, I can say that the questions were not asked in that way in this current Eurobarometer. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, Dr. Simpson has a second question. She says, while the overall attitudes towards the EU are positive, she wants to know whether there are any indications that the knowledge gap is being addressed. For example, positive attitudes in Ireland towards the EU, she thinks, is due to Irish people being more knowledgeable about the EU. Do you think that there is a close correlation between knowledge about the EU and positivity towards the EU and maybe do we need to do more to educate people about what actually happens in the EU and how the EU works? Yeah, like Ireland is a smaller country, we would have more connections or understand, I suppose, or know probably in terms of MEPs um, and, and, and that, so there's a little bit more of a, a, a connection there, um, you know, and, and certainly in some some of the institutions like the European Parliament and, and, and that. Um, so so in one sense it it, it, it does help yeah definitely. Um, but when you when you get into the detail of some of the other areas, it, it can get a little bit sketchy like in other countries as well. So I would say it's a, it's to a degree of education, but also um, information just about what's being done. Um, um, and you know, having the EU uh, prominent in our in our news, yeah, in terms of activities uh, and that, and I, I just get the feeling that it is probably a little bit more pervasive in terms of the information and the contact and that in in Ireland and that, which leads to just a degree. Uh, we're not all experts, certainly in the EU, but a, a degree of better familiarity or higher familiarity with the EU versus maybe some other states. Okay, thank you. And the next question goes back to the issue of radio and the trust that Irish people have in radio. And the question is, you know, is the level of trust that Irish people have in radio and TV in particular linked to any particular demographic? I mean, the question is, is it really reflective of our young population or do you think it's the older people that are listening to radio and watching watching television? Do you have any views on that? Please look. Yeah. So, so you, yeah, in terms of any sort of channel or media analysis, you'll see, I suppose, um, older individuals um, will score radio and TV a little bit higher than, than younger ones. That's the, the, that's the first dynamic. What, what's interesting, I suppose, when we actually looked at the media uh, aspect um, um, was that, um, you know, that younger individuals were probably had a lower trust um, in the media. Um, so 15 to 24 has had a lower trust in, in media just in, in general, so they're less likely to, to, to score any of the channels and that. So there's an engagement piece for all of us there to engage with youth, as we all know, <laughs> anyway. Uh, um, so that's, that's the first aspect. Uh, but also, you know, trust in, for example, social networks um, and that, you know, it was still at a very, very low, it was still at a low level um, for, for 15 to, to 24 year olds compared to radio and TV. So they had twice as much trust in radio and TV than they had, for example, in social networks uh, and that, you know? So it's not as if that there was just heightened degree of trust necessarily in the other more online digital forms. That's not necessarily the case in that, you know? Um, uh, and that, you know, so it would be, there are less um, engagement and by watching maybe TV to some extent, yeah? Uh, and then radio, maybe to a certain extent as well, is more challenging as a medium uh, and that. But they still have higher levels of trust in those mediums versus, say, um, the online digital formats, which is kind of interesting. 
Okay, thanks. Uh, I'd like to encourage people to keep sending the questions in because the the questions are interesting. But I think Luke's uh, replies are even more interesting. Uh, we have a question from the Europe Direct Centre in Blanchardstown, and the Europe Direct Centres are those uh, places around the country that give out information on the EU. Um, we work very closely with them. And Barry O'Carroll asks, uh, why do you think Ireland has a consistently positive view of the EU over the past years in general? I mean, you answered that sort of uh, earlier and say that, you know, Irish people like to see what it is that the uh, the EU has done for them. But why positive? And, you know, why did it dip around the time of the uh, financial crisis and the time of the so-called bailout, for example? Yeah. Yeah. So look, yes, we have a, we have a consistently positive views because we feel we've benefited. You know, and being part of the club has been has been very beneficial to Ireland um, uh, and that overall and that. And, and people recognise that they they do it. They see it everywhere they 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 go in that. And 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 interesting even in terms of roads, it's marked EU. It's marked. It's branded. You know, and it's so important to that. Now, why it dipped around the IMF? It was just austerity. You know, so. Um, you know, again, you know, we can all remember the visions of a few people coming in from the IMF, you know, walking down the street in with briefcases to tell us to tighten our belts and to put up and were felt to be behind all the austerity measures um, that would cause a lot of pain in Ireland for a number of years and that, you know. But we started to get over that as we came out. And interesting, uh, what it shows about the, the Irish, it shows just, you know, the, the, the not only the forgiving nature but the balanced views and well yeah okay that was a point in time you know and the positivity has grown again um uh, even before the coronavirus um uh, pandemic and that uh, and then has taken off again um uh, as a to, 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 to new heights as, as well as that you know so i suppose image perceptions um how things are done and communicated it's parcel and parcel of, of, of life and that. And we can see, I suppose, it's it's a lovely a journey over the last um, 21 years on that, that particular chart. You can see the positive and where it dipped uh, and, and it went back up again. Okay, uh, thanks. And just sticking with the, uh, the coronavirus or the COVID pandemic, um, I see that, you know, Irish people's satisfaction with the measures taken both by the EU and by the government uh, to tackle the pandemic is is quite high. How do you explain this high satisfaction? Tim, you've frozen there. Clearly, at the early stage, uh, and the delay in in accessing uh, vaccines, uh, the reluctance to support the trips with. Tim, you're breaking up there a little. Uh, okay, do, do you want me to repeat that question? Sorry, sorry, yeah, could you, sorry, thank you. Okay, so the, the question related to uh, the uh, COVID-19 and the uh, rate of satisfaction that's shown in this survey with the um, the Irish governments and the EU approach to tackle the pandemic. So I'm just wondering how you explain uh, that people's satisfaction is, is very high, given that, uh, especially at an early stage in the pandemic, people were quite critical uh, about the slow rollout of, of vaccines and uh, people were blaming the EU, uh, for example, for not agreeing to a TRIPS waiver to allow poor member states to, to manufacture the vaccines. So why do you think that there is a sort of, if you like, a little bit of a disconnect between what we mm -hmm. thought was happening at the time and how people have uh, have now yeah. said that they felt yeah classic human psychology self-preservation -pres unfortunately um like there was uh, certainly knowledge delays um angst you know around the sourcing why can't be and we saw uh, the uh, uh, the uk quick out of the blocks you know and there was looking over there and you know so that was the, the first immediate uh, focus on that uh, but look, we're very, the Irish are very compliant, you know, we're very acquiescent, you know, we're not very militant or extreme. As I mentioned, there's no real hard left or hard right, you know, we're very centralist of that. And we tend to put to the party line, you know, um, to, 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 a large, to a large extent, if there's a, you know, a, a solid plan, it's, it's sense, you know, sensible and, and appears well communicated and, and so forth and that. And the vaccine rollout, when it got going, it, it just took over everything, you know. It was it was like uh, it, it was how it was communicated was extremely well. Um, so it was literally like a, 
tapped into human psychology is a counter that everyone looked at. How many more? How many more? How many more? And everyone just got just literally sucked up in that journey of, of, of vaccinations and that. So very well. Uptake. And then if, I think it's been a classic lesson on communication as well. Um, very good communication then through the mid part, maybe a little bit less in terms of the boosters uh, and that. And that's been a little bit more, more challenging than that. Yeah. Um, around the, the trips in terms of the waiver and that, that probably wasn't foremost in Joe Public's mind. And, and to be honest, I think there was probably a little bit of guilt there if you dig under the surface with people, but people felt, oh, you know, almost like when we were doing some qualitative work is it, it, people were using the analogy, um, it's like an oxygen mask, you know, when it drops from a plane, you know, you're, you're told to put it on yourself first, you know, uh, and, and almost justifying to themselves that that's okay. And that's why this is being done and just pushing that that to one side in terms of poorer countries and that. Not to say that that won't come back again uh, as, a, as a topic of conversation um, uh, and that is, as we roll through this into areas. But I, I think there was a, self, a bit of self-preservation and, you know, just Irish people just turning a little bit of a blind eye to that, I suspect, and that, you know. Okay, thanks. Thanks for that, Luke. Uh, I'd encourage everybody to keep sending in the questions. We have had quite a lot of questions and I think Luke has answered them really spectacularly uh, this morning. Uh, the address for the questions is at the bottom of your screen. I have another question from uh, Barry O'Carroll at the Europe Drug Centre in Blanchestown. And this time uh, he wants to know a little bit about disinformation. Uh, and he's wondering whether or not there were any potential threats to to Ireland's positive perception of the EU arising from disinformation and in particular online content where there's a wealth of disinformation about the EU and he's wondering is there a way of, of pushing back at this disinformation? Yeah well it is it's a perennial issue for many organizations to be honest you know I think the, the war in Ukraine um, um, is serving to illustrate that, um, you know, trying to verify on every side what, what's what's true and reflective, you know. Um, and, I, and I think, yeah, certainly around the vaccine programme, um, uh, and that has certainly come, come through in that, you know. And it's reflected in, I think, the scores that the younger individuals, going back to an earlier question, give uh, for social media networks, you know. We're only 23%, I think, in the youngest age group would, would trust social media networks, you know. Um, you know, uh, and that's pretty much the same as those in the 40 to 54 age bracket, you know. You know, so um it's it's I think look, I don't I don't have an answer, but I, all I say is yeah, we need to uh, combat it. It is it is uh it is a it's a challenge across for all organizations uh and that and um and trust and the coronavirus has the pandemic has served to illustrate the importance of good quality information, um, reputable um, journalistic views, uh, and that you know. And I think that'll I, that's one of the la lasting legacies I think of uh, of of the pandemic, you know. But I think it's beholden all to, to try and tackle that, you know. And it, unfortunately, it does come through online quick more quickly uh, than than other forms. Okay, thanks. Uh, and again, I would encourage people to keep sending in the questions. The next question that we have is from Francis Jacobs. And Francis was the head of the European Parliament Information Office here in Dublin up to a number of years ago. And he asks about the, the housing question. And he wonders whether or not the survey had any uh, question about housing because housing seems to be the main issue that impacts on, on Irish people. And he's wondering whether, you know, is this uh, strictly an Irish problem uh, or whether it's a, a European wide wide problem? Uh, and I mean, you know, just, just to jump in before you answer the question, I mean, I know that uh, in some polls we ask the question, you know, what are the issues which are most affecting you uh, in your country? And for Ireland, housing always comes up on top. But I don't know if, if the housing was a uh, part of, of, of this particular survey, but maybe you might address that, please, uh, for Francis. Thanks. There was a question, I don't know the, 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 the figure off the top of my head, there was a question in there that, that just, you know, uh, top, top um, issues at the moment, you know, top two issues at the moment and that. I think I th I'm nearly certain that housing was on, on that list. But you're, you're quite right, right? Just, you know, it is, it is one of the top issues for Ireland, that is, that is, that comes out in any of the polling that we do um, for Irish people and that. And um, when you look at that by age breaks, it, it comes across 
population, but in particular amongst those who are obviously looking for the, the housing uh, of that. And to what extent, you're, the second part of your question, do you think it's a, do Irish people think it's a European or an Irish problem? They, they probably do get quite interested and think it is more of an Irish problem, albeit it, there's a challenge there, <laughs> I know, across Europe. Um, but they do get uh, quite interested and, and, and quite focused in it's my son or daughter can't get get a get a rent or rent a place or get a house or can't afford and, and and the prices are going up because of supply and that and look the situation has been exasperated by the pandemic undoubtedly where we shut down um building uh, and that we're already behind you know uh, we shut down and our population is growing as well uh, and that so it's 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 a, it's a little bit of a, a perfect storm uh, and that you know Okay, thanks, Luke. Uh, we're actually coming to the the end of the questions, unless somebody else has got more questions uh, to send in. But uh, the last question that I have here on my list is regarding the economic outlook uh, that Irish people have, and the outlook for Irish people is really quite favourable compared to the the other member states. What do you think uh, accounts for this? I mean, why are Irish people, you know, more favourable, uh, more positive about the economic mm. outlook than the other people in the other member states? Yeah, well, I suppose a key focus is jobs. Uh, I'll be honest. You know, uh, look, you know, you know, when employ unemployment is low, uh, Irish people are generally happier and uh, more positive towards the economy. Um, and you know, like where I think we're the, the last we were about seven percent uh, unemployment level. So we've been dr dropping and getting back to pre-pandemic levels and that. You know, um, so that that is a, a, a big factor. You know, people are employed. You know, working. Uh, incomes coming coming in when unemployment is high in Ireland, you know people are, are very nervous uh, and, and that you know. Um, when the economic crash uh, happened, you know, in the, you know, sorry, the economic cons, it took a dip in the pandemic, uh, but it was it, even when it dipped during the pandemic, it was no way as low as when uh, the economic crash happened. Uh, you know, so that was that was interesting. So it dipped, um, but it, it was able to spring back again. And also, there's been a huge amount of economic support provided to government, and that's really aided um, uh, confidence. And it's enabled, I suppose, uh, everybody to hit the ground running every time we reopened. So it was like a stop start, stop start. And we were tracking, I suppose, confidence uh, along those reopenings uh, and that. And, and they rebounded uh, quite swiftly uh, and that. So uh, people, I think, feel, notwithstanding all the challenges that, that, are, that, that we all know, that the Irish economy is in a good place, a much better place than it was during the last crash. There's less household debt around as well than in terms of the last crash uh, as well in that. Um, and obviously the forecasts, albeit they've cut a little bit this morning, are still one of the most uh, positive forecasts. And, you know, the media does contribute to it as well. So when people see it's still growth is still going up, it, it, it breeds that sense of uh, sense of confidence. But jobs is, is one of the key things obviously, in the, in the Irish market office. Okay, thanks. Uh, thanks very much, Luke. Look, uh, I think that's all of the questions that we've got, which have been satisfied. And I just want to thank you once again, Luke, for your contribution, uh, and especially for lending your expertise and, and knowledge to this event. I mean, I think everybody would agree that it was hugely informative. I certainly learned, learned quite a lot. Mm -hmm. And listen, thanks to you, the audience, for joining us today and for engaging so fully in our question and answer session. Those of you who want to read the report uh, in full, it's now available on our website. That's euireland.ie, e-u-i-r-e-l-a-n-d.ie, as well as on the Eurobarometer website. So a final word of thanks to the team at European Movement Ireland uh, for their work on this event. And I wish you all a, a nice afternoon. And once again, Luke, thank you so much for, for your skill and expertise in answering all of those difficult questions. Thanks very much. Welcome, and bye-bye, everybody. Bye-bye.